Good morning, everyone. I'm Roger Forshaw. I'm a lecturer at the KH Centre for Biomedical Egyptology at the University of Manchester. And I'm going to talk to you today about the teeth of Takabuti. So why are we interested in ancient teeth? What can they tell us about that particular individual? Well, teeth are the hardest and most chemically stable tissues in the body and often survive long after the supporting structures have deteriorated in the archaeological picture. Unlike bones, teeth interact directly with the environment during life. Mastication, wear, traumatic events, this sort of thing. As a result, they can provide information about the diet, oral hygiene, and indeed the health of an individual while they were still alive. Basically, they are an indispensable part of any attempt to reconstruct past lifestyles from human remains. Of course, there are problems when attempting to examine the teeth of a mummy, the main issue being access. On a patient today in a dental surgery with good illumination and magnification, the dentist can have a detailed visual examination of a patient's teeth. However, looking at archaeological specimens, there are obvious problems. If you have a skull, you can pick it up, look at the surfaces of the teeth and determine any pathological features, any irregularities in the teeth. But once you're into a mummified body with sarcophagi, coffins or wrapped bodies, then visual access is not possible. So some form of imaging such as scanning or radiographic examinations are the only option. Now, before CT scanning was introduced in the 1970s, conventional x-rays were taken. But because of the overlap of all the anatomical structures, as well as resins, embalming material, coffin material, on the film itself, it's quite difficult to obtain much useful information. The images were quite blurred. However, with the advent of CT scanning, it's possibly to select to selectively eliminate these overlapping structures by means of sophisticated software packages. And so we can examine a mummy's teeth in more detail. Now with Takabuti, you have a combination of different situations here. Although she was mummified and sealed inside her coffin some 2,600 years ago, she was subsequently unwrapped as you can see here, at the time of the 1835 investigation. The result is the teeth are partially visible. So it's possible to visually examine the teeth in some detail. Is it? Unfortunately, not as well as I would have liked. The inflexible and leathery nature of the mummified tissue prevents it from being reflected back to allow a full view of the teeth. And we've got to remember, of course, that the skin, lips, which are so flexible during life, are very brittle in the mummified uh, state. Too much pressure on them would result in fragments breaking away, which obviously wouldn't go down too well with the curator, the museum authorities and the public uh, at large. But Takabuti's mouth was partially open which just permitted a dental mirror to be inserted between the teeth and it allowed some of the surfaces of the teeth to be examined. A partial examination really, so we had to supplement this with CT scanning to provide further information. You can see here on the left of the image a CT scan of the upper and lower jaw of Takabuti and this shows a two-dimensional view, a half circle really from ear to ear, flattening all the teeth out. So useful. On the right, a lateral radiograph of the skull. And you can see this is less useful because of the overlap of other structures. And so it's not actually showing the teeth too clearly. So we have to remember, of course, it's very difficult to position a mummy to obtain the best radiographic result. But this partial visual examination, together with the radiographic and CT scan results, enables to provide uh, an insight into the dental health of Takabuti. 
and overall the appearance of the teeth is quite good. They are regularly arranged, there's no space in between them, none of them are rotated or twisted and none are missing, or in fact a good position and aligned symmetrically. The third molar teeth, the wisdom teeth, are present with fully formed roots, indicating from a dental viewpoint Takabuti was at least 18 to 25 years old when she died, and if not older. One interesting feature is the presence of an additional tooth in the midline of the mandible, the, the lower jaw. This additional incisor, probably a supplemental tooth, which is normal in appearance, resembles incisors on either side, as opposed to a supernumerary tooth, which is an abnormal tooth. And you can see in this 3D construction of the CT scan um, uh, shown here. Supplemental teeth in the mandible, they're quite rare really, figures of about a thousand, one in a thousand are suggested. Uncertain why they occur, possibly a splitting of the tooth bud when the teeth are developing. Hereditary may have a part to play, but they have no consequence really. Uh, the appearance is not affected. In fact, many people may not even be aware they have an additional tooth until this is pointed out to them. Now, what about any dental disease present and anything else of any interest? Well, caries, tooth decay. There's only one example in the mouth of Takabuti. That's a buccal caries cavity in the maxillary, the upper teeth, uh, right at the back, the third molar. Caries is the result of the breakdown of refined carbohydrates in the diet, particularly sucrose and fructose, broken down by bacteria found in the plaque deposited on teeth. Caries was present in ancient Egypt, but throughout most of the dynastic period, the incidence was fairly low due to the lack, of course, of these refined carbohydrates in the diet of the ancient Egyptians. This particular cavity we're talking about in the wisdom tooth it's on the outside of the tooth and was probably caused by food trapping and then being held there by the cheek. This occurs when the particular tooth is tilted outwards or the flesh of the cheek is held quite tightly against the tooth. And then because of this, the food is then not displaced by the natural movement of the tongue or cheek and washed away by the saliva. Judicious brushing with a toothbrush would clear this. But as we will see shortly, aids to oral hygiene may have been lacking in ancient Egypt. This is quite an extensive cavity, so it may have caused some toothache. Gum disease, uh, there's little indication of uh, gum disease or periodontal disease in Takabuti. There's no deposits of calculus evidence on the teeth. So of course, did Takabuti clean her teeth regularly? Well, we know that hygiene was important in ancient Egypt and evidence of the elite suggests as many of the population washed every day, cosmetics, perfumes being an important part of life for both sexes. And you can see some of the cosmetic items that have been recovered from ancient Egypt in this image here. And although many cosmetic and toilet articles have been discovered, nothing resembling a toothbrush has ever been found. Possibly some form of wooden toothpick may have been used in ancient Egypt, as it's known that other civilizations in antiquity used various implements such as dew sticks, tree twigs, birds feathers, this sort of thing. Uh, perhaps something resembling a miswak may have been used. The miswak being a twig of the Salvador persica tree whose ends have been frayed. The miswak is reputed to have been used by the ancient Babylonians. It's known to have been used for oral care by Muslims since the birth of Islam, and indeed it's still in use today. So possibly Takabuti availed herself of just such an aid. 
Toothwear, the final dental feature I want to mention is toothwear and condition so widespread that it was found in most of the ancient Egyptian teeth throughout the dynastic age. You can see on this slide some images of teeth. We're actually looking down on them and on the left top and bottom, uh, the teeth show no evidence of tooth wear on their biting, their occlusal surfaces. The cusps are still quite obvious. On the right, notice how the teeth are worn down quite rapidly. And this happens from an early age due, of course, to the diet or rather the contamination of bread, the staple food, with large numbers of inorganic particles, mainly sand. And we're fortunate in having samples of ancient bread which has survived over the millennia. And analysis of these has shown uh, predominantly rounded grains of silica and sand. Small percentage of these uh, other materials, other organic materials as well as. And the far left of the slide, you can see some uh, samples of ancient Egyptian bread. And we know how the sand contaminated the food to such an extent. We're talking about a desert environment, of course. Much of the adulteration was windblown. Also, their farming methods were responsible for this contamination. And we've some idea how they farmed from the uh, various tomb scenes I'm showing here, such as that of Senedjem at Thebes. They used, for example, flint harvesting tools, fragments of which would break off, contaminate the soil, uh, particles of soil itself would contaminate the grain. And of course, it's not sift, the grain isn't sift uh, as it is today. Examples of winnowing in the sandy desert environment. The tomb of Napt at Thebes there. Uh, ancient Egyptian woman on the bottom of the left there, grinding corn using soft sandstone implements, particles of which would break off and contaminate the grain. And of course, the grain was stored in mud brick granaries. Further contamination would occur there. But Takabuti's teeth didn't show evidence of the heavy tooth wear that you see in most Egyptian teeth. There was some wear, but it's not too extensive. And one possible explanation for this lack of tooth wear could relate to the particular diet that Takabuti consumed. She's known to um, have been the daughter of a priest and as such may have been given various foodstuffs by her father. In the temple, food offerings would have been presented to the god on a daily basis. And after a period of time when it was considered that the god had partaken of the essence of the food, then it would have been removed from the presence of the god and distributed to the priesthood for their personal consumption. And the food will almost certainly have been of high quality, would have consisted of large quantities of meat, fruit and vegetables, and you can see examples in many of the wall scenes from the temples in ancient Egypt. And this high protein diet with vegetable and fruit content would not have caused the same degree of tooth wear as a diet which um, predominantly consisted of adulterated bread, which the majority of the population would have consumed. So this is one possibility for the lack of tooth wear evident in Takabuti. So what we have with Takabuti, a good set of teeth, nicely arranged, only one tooth that was decayed, which may have caused some discomfort. She had an additional low incisor, which would have been of little consequence to her. She had no gum disease and very little wear on the teeth. Unlike many of her fellow ancient Egyptians who suffered from worn, sensitive and abscessed teeth, and where toothache would have been part of everyday life and where there was little in the way of dental treatment to relieve these painful conditions. And so this is completes the presentation. Thank you all for listening to me.